be a great time of worship. Uh, we have several items on our upcoming events. Um, as things start to roll over into March, uh, it will pick up. But I do want you to remember all of those on our prayer list. Continue to remember uh, Brantley uh, and also Patrick uh, in your prayers. Um, Nancy, huh? Okay. 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 All right. So, but continue to remember Patrick. Uh, Nancy's other co-worker, Cindy Weeks. Continue to remember Cindy in your prayers. Uh, are there any other outspoken this evening? Okay, yep, the 27th. Okay, all right. So remember that, Miss Ellen? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay, all right. Um, all of that is to lead up to um, uh, her surgery um, to uh, fuse her back. Uh, but remember, continue to remember Miss Renee, of course, Miss Marie, Brother Earl, um, Miss Ellen, uh, Miss Sue, and Miss Joyce. And, uh, and there's so many uh, right now. Uh, but um, let's remember all of those on our prayer list as we've uh, as we've already said. Uh, Amen, amen, and Miss Lib too. It's good to see Miss Lib feeling better tonight. Amen. Amen. Beautiful to have, um, bro beautiful to have brothers and sisters, isn't it? Huh. Amen. That's what we're called to be as brothers and sisters. But anyway, all right. Uh, any others this evening? Okay. 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 All right. Okay. And remember your dad, too, and your your entire family, yes. Miss D. All right. So remember Miss D. Any others? You know, I've, 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 you know, a lot of people have gone away from doing prayer time, but I believe prayer time is a praise time. Huh? I believe prayer time is a praise time. Because, see, we start out, we start out praising God, and that's what we're instructed to do, and then we bring our petitions to Him, and He's, a, he's the kind of God that loves to hear our petitions. He loves to hear uh, what we're going through. He likes us to speak to Him. He already knows. Oh, but he wants you to talk to him about it in a few minutes. And, and then he wants you to get back to the praise. And he begins in praise and we end in praise, all right? So, but anyway, uh, any others? Yeah. yeah, so so he rewards the praises then is what I heard in that. Well, hey, well, uh, that ought to make us want to praise him even more, right? Amen, amen. Uh, he loves, he inhabits the praises of his people. He loves when we praise him. All right, any others this evening? Yes. Okay. And tomorrow they have a funeral at 2 o'clock tomorrow. Okay, the and it's all at Parish? Okay. 2 o'clock tomorrow. Okay. All right. Anything else? If not, let's go to the Lord in prayer this evening then. And uh, then we're going to open up His uh, Holy Word. Heavenly Father, we do thank You for this time. We thank You for this place. We thank You for this opportunity. We thank You, Lord, for all that You do. We come tonight... Lord, to lift up the name of Jesus. But Lord, most of all, we come tonight to open up your holy word that your spirit might speak. Lord, that you might lead us, guide us, and direct us. And Lord, I do pray tonight 
that you will do just that. Lord, you've heard the many requests, the names that have been mentioned. Lord, each and every one of them tonight is looking for a touch from you. And Lord, so we claim healing in their, in their lives and over their bodies. We claim healing in wherever their need is. And Lord, we ask you tonight, Lord, that you just meet with them where they are, that you wrap your arms around them, anoint them, Lord. May the Spirit of God indwell, and may the Spirit of God give them joy, peace, and comfort this evening. And Lord, we just ask you now, we ask you, Lord, to be uh, with all of those that are sick and suffering. We pray for those that are lost and undone, that, Lord, they might come to know you as Lord and Savior before it's everlasting too late. And, Lord, we do ask you, Lord, to be with all of those that serve our country. Lord, be with our country. Be with all of those that serve our communities. Uh, Lord, wherever they may be, Lord, we do pray your hedge of protection. But, Lord, once again, we thank you. We thank you for loving us. We thank you for being with us. And we thank you for this opportunity that we have to open up your word. Lord, as we find encouragement in your word, lead us, guide us, and direct us. And we give you praise, honor, and glory. For it's in the name of the Lord Jesus we pray. Amen and amen. All right, open your Bibles this evening to the book of Matthew we're going to be Matthew chapter 14, or uh, chapter 9, verse 14 is where we're going to be starting at. Woo. Even with my glasses on, I can't see it. Mm. Woo. Chapter 9, verse 14. As we continue our study through Matthew And we look at the encouragement that is found in the Word of God. And, and that's what Jesus here in these, these passages, that is His goal, is to encourage the disciples. And I don't know of anybody, I, I'm, I mean, I, I, there's days that I need encouragement. There's days that I'm not feeling real encouraged and I need somebody to encourage me. And, but as brothers and sisters, as Christ, as the children of God, that's what we're supposed to do. That's what we're called to do. When we go out into the world, we're called to go out and be an encouragement, not a discouragement. We're called to encourage people. We're called to make somebody's name, not mess it up. And that's what, we're, that's what we should be doing. And that's what Jesus here through these passages is doing. And, and here he's going to take a moment to teach them just a little bit because I don't know about you, but um, I need every now and then, I need him to teach me. Matter of fact, I need him to teach me every day. And he's willing to do just that. He's willing to, he's willing to open himself up. That's the kind of God that he is. He's willing to open himself up. And, and teach us and spend time with us. He loves to spend time with us. You see, I still say, I mean, if you've got a place, a quiet place, where you go and you spend time, you pray, you maybe read your Bible, I tell you, if you've only got one chair in there, you take another one in there and set it in front of you where you're facing it, and you just uh, you go about your day, you go on about your prayer, and you go on about your time. And I, I can assure you that at some point in time, the Holy Spirit will sit down in that chair in front of you. Because that's the kind of God He is. He wants to commune with you. He wants to spend time with you. He wants, he wants that alone time. You know, we come together to worship. That's what we're here for tonight. We're here to open up His Holy Word and let the Spirit of God lead us and speak to us and talk to us. And, and I, you know... Um, I'm, I'm blessed in the fact that I get to do what I do. Um, but now it's not because I have any ability to do it. I've said that over and over and over again. I don't have the ability to do it. God grants it. And I'm so grateful He does. I'm so grateful that He allows us the opportunity to spend time in His Word and that He will speak to us and guide us. As we look at what he says tonight in Matthew chapter 9, we'll begin in verse 14 um, in, in your word, in your Bible. In verse 14 he says, Then came to him the disciples of John, saying, 
Who do we and the Pharisees all fast? He says, why do we do that? But thy disciples fast not. And Jesus said unto them, Can the children of the bride chamber mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? But the day will come when the bridegroom shall be taken away from them, and then shall they fast. No man putteth a piece of new cloth into an old garment, for that which is put in to fill it up taketh from the garment, and the rent is made worse. Neither do men put new wine into old bottles, else the bottle break, and the wine runneth out, the bottle and the bottle perish. But they put new wine in new bottles, and both are preserved. May God bless the reading and expounding of His holy word in the name of Jesus. Amen. So when we look at these verses of Scripture, the first thing that we see in verse 14 is that the disciples of John have now come to Jesus and they've asked Him a question. Why do we and the Pharisees fast? And your disciples don't. Hmm. Well, you know, to us it would seem like it was a a legitimate question. But the thing that we need to remember as we look at our scriptures is, is that Christ came. He came for a purpose. It was not to destroy the law, but that the law might be fulfilled. And so when we think about it like that and we look at the question that they asked, why do we fast and your disciples don't, we understand Jesus' answer. Because what he was really, they were really asking him was, why, why are y'all so joyful and not fasting as a morning? You see, because fasting slowed things down. Jesus didn't want it slowed down. Not at this point in time. He needed it. He needed them going. He needed them energetic and enthusiastic. Oh, he needed them on fire. And so that gives us the answer to the question that they asked. You see, the church is to be a place of joy. It's a place where we come and we open up the Word of God and we get encouraged by what He tells us, by His instruction on how to live our life. So many people are living their life by their own rules and their own ways and they're failing at it. They think they're succeeding, but they're failing. And, and yet God says, if you'll just, you just hear my voice, if you'll just follow my voice. You see, I like the fact when he says, I'm the good shepherd. And my sheep, my sheep, they hear my voice and they know my voice and I know my sheep. I like the fact that, that we are known of God and that we are, are counted to be in his flock. But the disciples were not getting, they were not understanding. The church is a place of joy. In Isaiah 56 verse 7 Even them will I bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices shall be accepted upon my altar for mine house shall be called a house of prayer for all people. It's a place that we can come. Prayer is a form of worship. That's the reason why when Jesus gave us the model prayer, He said, you pray it this way. You pray it with praise. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And after you praise Him, then you come to the petitions. As I said, you come to the point where now you say, Father, I now have a need. Not just my need, but I bring you the needs of my brothers and my sisters. I bring you the need of my church, my family. I bring you the need of those around me, my co-workers. I bring their needs. Oh, but then we end it once again with praise. You see, he's worthy of the praise. You see, Brother Alan Pooley used to say, you ask him, 
and then you praise him for it. Huh? You ask him and you praise him for it. You want the answer, you praise him. You want the gift, you praise him. Be thankful of what he's done. Be thankful of what he's going to do. Our God is mighty, church. He says that what we're supposed to do, even in Isaiah, the Old Testament, he says, I will bring to my holy mountain. I'll bring them. <laughs> I'll bring them and, and, and make them joyful. You see, to be in the presence of God should bring joy. To be in the presence of the Holy Spirit should bring joy and it should bring hope and it should bring uh, back to that enthusiasm. You know, Apostle Paul said zeal. Uh, you see, we're supposed to have as much zeal serving Christ as the Apostle said he had for persecuting the church. Oh, but he turned his zeal around and he... He served God. You see, the thing is, is that in churches today, so many of them have, over the years, have got to the place that, that they are somber and they're gloomy. That's not the way God's house was designed to be. It wasn't. We're not in the synagogue. We're in the house of God, a place of worship a place where we lift up the name of Jesus. He said, if you lift me up before men, I will draw all men unto myself. I'll draw them. This is not a place where we come and, and are somber. We come with reverence and respect for God's house. But yet at the same time, it's okay. It's all right to say amen. It's okay to raise your hands. There's a whole lot of hand raising going on this morning in the song to our praise and worship, our opening song this morning. Woo. It's okay. It's all right. Because that's what we're supposed to do. He's worthy of it. I promise you, around the throne of God tonight, in heaven, the saints have their hands extended up and they're singing all kinds of praises to the Lamb. They're singing worthy is the Lamb. Holy, holy, holy. Jesus said, see, you're, you're missing the point. And so verse 15, he gives them the answer and he gives it to them in an illustration so that they will understand. He says, Can the children of the bride chamber mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? Huh? You have to understand that a wedding ceremony during Jesus' day was seven days long, it was a celebration. It was a party. It was the joining of two souls to one. And it was a celebration that, that went on for seven whole days. Jesus said as long as the bridegroom is there at the celebration, then why and where do you have time to take a break? He was not condemning fasting because he said there would come a time for it. He said there would come a time, but Jesus said as long as I'm here, as long as the bridegroom is present, there's no time for that. Right now it's time to learn and to praise. It's time to stay busy about the Father's business. You remember that's what he was here for, right? I'm about my father's business. Oh, church, we need to be about our father's business. He said, it's, it's not time for all of that. He said, because right now, right now while the bridegroom, right now while I'm with you, oh, there's other things to be done. Oh, there were sick to be healed. Oh, there was ministry to be accomplished. 
can you mourn during the celebration? Church, let me tell you something. Even at funerals today, if they were a child of God, then it should be a celebration. I'm not saying it needs to be a seven-day celebration, but it needs to be a celebration because what they've received is a gift from God, a promise that God has made, and He did not go back on His promise. The moment that a child of God closes their eyes and exhales their last breath here, God collects it all. And the apostle said to be absent of this body is to be present with the Lord. And so I'm excited about it. When it's my day, I'm ready for it. You see, the thing is, is that there's... He said, blessed are those that mourn, for they shall be comforted. It's okay, but don't spend your time in it. Don't get in it and stay. You see, so many people get locked in it. And a lot of times it's just the flesh. But we have to dig deep. We have to dig into what God has told us and we have to rejoice over what we know. For we know this is not it. This is not the best that God has got. The best is yet to come. The best is yet to come. He gave us the best gift we could ever have. Jesus. And he didn't stop there. He sent another comforter. And you notice that, that what he says here is he says um, in, in, in verse 15 again, he says, Can the children of the bride chamber mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? But the day will come, he said. And he's speaking futuristic. When the bridegroom shall be taken from them and then shall they fast. You see, he wasn't telling them not to. He just said he won't time for it. But there would come a time. Prayer and fasting is a great way to spend time with God. If you're able to do it, you need to do it. It's a great time to spend in communion with Him. But he says what's going to happen is is, is Huh. That visible presence is going to go away. Jesus said, I'm going to leave. But that was what he had already told them. That's what he had told them many times. He said, I must go that another comforter may come. Oh, so that God wouldn't leave us comfortless. You see, so many times in our lives, again, we in this day and time, we we so we get so locked into the fact that I'm by myself, but no, we're not. The message this morning was whatever He brings you to, He walks you through. He don't leave you there on your own. He don't say get through the best way you can. No, the psalmist said that God walked them through the midst of the sea. That God was present with them. And He says, I will not leave you nor forsake you so I'm counting on the fact that I don't have to walk through nothing in life by myself. But not only is God going to walk with me, I've got some faithful brothers and sisters that are also going to walk with me. And that's what it's really about. He says, then when I'm gone, you shall fast. You'll spend that time but right now, the bridegroom is with you. And right now is not it. You have to remember that he was talking to the disciples of John. Why are we fasting and you're not? Because it ain't time. But when time comes, guess what? That's where we'll be. And then he goes on. He doesn't stop there. He goes on to the next illustration because you see, the thing is, is that what Jesus is introducing to the world is a newness. It's no longer about the law. It's now about huh, the Spirit. It's not about a 
physical realm. It's now about a spiritual realm. He came to introduce us to the spiritual side of who God was. You can look through the Old Testament and see the physical side of God. You can look at Jesus and the image of who He was. And Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. He was the image of God in the flesh. But today, we have a spiritual connection to heaven. The Holy Spirit connects us. And so he goes on and he says about the newness. He says, no man. And, he, and, and the thing is, is that he's going back to religion. I've said it before and I'll say it again that Christianity is not a religion. Christianity is a relationship and a walk. It's not like the other world religions. How do we know? Because we got to live in God. We got a Savior who's alive and well. We got a Spirit of God that dwells not only in the world, but indwells the believer. He says, now, let's talk about the newness. No man putteth a new piece of cloth into an old garment. And he's talking about here, he's talking about the fact that Christianity is not going to be able to be sewed into Judaism. That Christianity is going to become far something far more different than Judaism was. Judaism was more of a religion. Christ was telling them that Christianity is not going to be that way. Christianity is going to be that relationship with our Father. We've got a personal relationship with the Creator of the universe. We've got a personal relationship with the Creator of the universe. And churches should never be somber. Because He said you can't you can't put the new that I've created into the old because it'll tear. There's no way you can do it. No way that you can do that. The Lord had not come to fix up Judaism. He had come to introduce something new. In Matthew 5, 17. Think not that I am come to destroy the law... Or the prophets, I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. He said, I came, to, I came to change things up. I came to show you a new relationship, a new way of worship. Oh, you don't have to, you won't have to go to the priest anymore. You won't have to go to the synagogue anymore. You, oh, you won't even have to go sacrifice anymore. Uh, because I'm going to become your sacrifice. I'm going to become your sacrifice for you. A one sacrifice once and for all. Once and for all. And so he didn't come. He came to fulfill what God had already said would happen. If you put it in there, if you put the new in the old, it's going to tear it's not going to last. The tear will be made worse. That's the reason I believe the Scriptures tell us that we're supposed to be of one mind, one voice. We're supposed to be one body. We're supposed to be one body. We're supposed to be believing in the same Jesus. We're supposed to be worshiping the same Jesus. The one that died for the world. That gave himself for everybody in the world. You see, all things must be made new. That's who God is. He's a God of newness. I'm not what I was. Huh? A few of you heard that song before, haven't you? I'm not what I was. Oh, but I'm not what I'm going to be either. I'm still a work in progress. Oh, I look forward to the day that it's completed, but until that day, I'm still being made new by the potter's hands. 
I'm being made over. You see, Jesus came to the point where he even come to the wine. He said, the thing about it is, is that you cannot, men cannot put new wine into old bottles. Else the bottles will break. And you have to remember in Jesus' day, they used animal skins, not glass. They used animal skins. And, and, and uh, I'm not going to ask how many of you know anything about making wine. I don't need to know all of that. Uh, yeah. But the thing with the wine was, was that when you put the wine in the bottle, it had to be a new skin. Because as the, the wine stayed in the bottle, it began to expel gases and ferment, and it began to expand. And, and the thing that Jesus was saying was, if you, if you put something new into something old, it can't hold it. It's going to explode. And when I think about that, I think about the fact that the Scriptures tell me that He made me a new creation, a new creature in Christ. I had to be made new in order to house what He was sending to be in me, to dwell in me. Because the Spirit of God was going to expand it. And it had to be new in order to last and endure he said I've got to make it new if I don't it'll break and then he says but, but they put new wine into new bottles and both are preserved oh church when when the scriptures tell us in Colossians 3.10 and he says that he has put on the new man which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. Have put on a new man. Oh, when I was born again, when you were born again, there was a transformation your identity changed. You become a child of God. He changed the heart. And then he began to change the outer part. I tell people on, on several occasions that if the outside of you hasn't changed, then they're wanting to change inside. If the way you do and the way you live and the way you treat people did not change, then there was not an internal Change. Because to know Jesus means that we have to change. We cannot remain the same. There is no way we can remain the same. Just to say I love Jesus means that you've got to change. We begin to care about things we said we wouldn't care about. Oh my. We begin to care about people we said we would never care about. Because that's what we're supposed to do. You see the thing is, is that his illustration was, was to get them focused on what they were supposed to do. How they were supposed to live. You see, it's not about you fasting right now. It's about you praying. It's about you being new. You can't fast if you ain't been made new. Huh. You see, I ask people sometimes, are you a new vessel? I might look like the old shell, but I'm not the same vessel. Huh? But I can tell you, I got a new one coming. But it's waiting for me somewhere else. Huh? I have to endure this one for just ever how long the Lord lets me endure. Ever how long He tarries in our lives, we have to endure. But He says, you can't put something new into something old. You can't take it 
So I'm going to give you something new. I'm going to give you something new. And then I'm going to give you something newer. I'm going to give you something that will, oh, oh, it'll set your world on fire. But I want you to notice, the scriptures also tell us that there's something else new. And in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 24, Jesus, the, the, the writer of Hebrews says, Jesus is the mediator of a new covenant. Mm. A new covenant. He said it was a new covenant in His blood. Mm. It's a new covenant in His blood. It's, it's the redeeming power of His blood is the new covenant. It's salvation through Christ is the new covenant. It's eternal life through the blood of Jesus Christ is the covenant. He's a mediator of a new covenant. Praise God. Praise God that He, that he is a God of newness. All things, the revelation says, in the very last days, the very end of all of it, all things shall be made new. The old things shall be done away. And all things shall become new. He's a God of start over. And I'm glad He gave us an opportunity to start over. Are you? I'm glad He gave us an opportunity to start over. So by just that, He's worthy of our praise. He's worthy of us telling Him how much we love Him. He's worthy of us worshiping Him and saying, We love you, Father. The psalmist said this morning, Thou art my King, O God. Oh, is He your King? I pray He is. Because He, he loves us so much. He wants us to know. You see, these are just encouraging words. These are just words to show us just what God has done. You see, it's because He loves us. It's because He loves us and He cares that He gives us His Word. He gives us His promises. And they're promises you can count on, you can bank on. They're promises that you can guarantee because Jesus Christ is our hope. He's our living hope each and every day. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for this day. We thank you for your word. We thank you for this opportunity that we've had to be in your house. We thank you for all that you do for us. Lord, we thank you for making us new and setting right that which was wrong. Lord, we thank you for your love that saves us. Lord, we just ask you now to use us this week that we might go out into the world and that we might be a light, your light, in the world we go into. Lead us, guide us, and direct us. We do again ask your blessings upon those that are sick and suffering. We do ask your blessings upon those, Lord, that are lost and undone. Lord, again, may we be your vessels. And we, may we, in newness, may we walk in newness, may we talk in newness, and most of all, may we lift up the name of Jesus that you might draw all men to yourself. Lead us, guide us, and direct us each and every step of our days. We give you praise, honor, and glory. For it's in the name of the Lord Jesus we pray. Amen and amen. God bless you, and thank you for being with us tonight.